So one of the key elements is that AI will help attribute because its ability to take a complexity and make it and make things simple to understand. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing, but uh, uh, how, how do you how do you use AI to improve like efficiency otherwise, and and how does it um, act, how does it contribute itself to campaigns? One key thing is personalization. Um, so when you're uh, you know like if you're if you're on a, a streaming platform or and you're you're watching you're seeing the suggestions given to you you know that's one form of a, of a machine learning on what suggestions it's going to give to you but uh it, it can go further to maybe the ad you're displayed is a different ad than what i'm displayed and maybe they're not even all that different but you may like cats and i may like dogs and so mm -hmm. uh in the exact same format of the ad you see a cat i see a dog what does that impact do uh, at a at a uh, uh, an immediate deployment fast fast coming to you versus coming to me does it does it add a lift at all to your your campaign um, Okay, everybody, uh, welcome to Nova Podcast, where we explore the creative minds shaping now the marketing world. I'm your host, Stephanie, and today we have a special guest joining us. His name is Brandon Kopp. He has pioneered courageous marketing strategies that grab customers' attention, resonate with them emotionally, and launch them into a robust, memorable customer journey, which is very important nowadays. So let's dive right in. Brandon, could you tell us first, of course, a little bit about yourself and how you got started into the marketing industry? Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, uh, Nuova, for having me. Um, you know, it aligns perfectly with what I do, the fact that you're internationally based. Uh, you know, I'm I'm very focused on helping uh, internationally based companies enter into the United States and expand through the United States. So um, that international focus is uh, is exciting for me to talk to all of your uh, listeners today. And um, yeah, I mean, I uh, I've been marketing for 17 years. I've uh, I've, wor I've worked in house. I've worked uh, within agencies. I've I've done a bit of it all, and um, I'm excited to dive into how that career kind of has uh, progressed from the early stages to the middle years, and then to now uh, what I'm working on. Of course, and we are really willing to hear that. So if you can first like talk to us about first your journey. How do you get there? And now that you are now here with us, I will be very inspiring sure. for many people to get to know the, the curve from you. Yeah. So, you know, marketing is such a, a broad, uh, oh, yeah. or I mean, such a, a large scoping field that yeah. um, there's so many different areas of specialty you can, you can focus in. And so I spent my early years really building a foundation of skills. So uh, mm -hmm. from content creation, you know, I, uh, I focused on, um, on video uh, specifically and learning how to perfect uh, video creation. I did, uh, you know, in my very early years, uh, internships with MTV, uh, a television station here in the States, um, in New York City, and uh, with a channel that was launching, um, a premium paid subscription channel that was launching under the uh, Paramount uh, Pictures umbrella out in Los Angeles. So I learned very quickly, you know, on that content creation side, uh, which was a skill that's ca carried through uh till today. And then there was, uh, I, I did field marketing. So I was working with a corporation that had 500, um, uh, banking stores throughout the banking locations throughout the United States, uh, all spread throughout the United States. And, and, uh, I was the liaison between the 500 store locations in the corporate marketing department. So, um, you know, between traveling the U S and understanding all the different, uh, segments and cultures that, that exist, even just within one country, let alone internationally, uh, mm -hmm. th that was important, but also understanding what it takes to have a, a presence in the field and, and what a good presence, what, what, what your windows should look like, what kind of materials you need in the field. But then beyond that, um, other foundational skills, you know, I worked for a company that was, uh, really doing a bunch of social good. Um, mm -hmm. So we partnered with large Fortune 500 companies like Intel and HP and Jaguar Land Rover. And we were doing um, uh, 
basically taking technology and putting it to, to use uh, to solve medical problems that, that, uh -huh. that were out of the non-existent or, or no solution yet. And, um, but, but those brands sponsored it and they were getting uh, the, the, again, back to the video footage um, of them doing good in the world. Lastly, the the early foundational skills involved a lot of inbound and outbound marketing. So uh, outbound from from cold outreaching to people, but but also inbound just on um, you know establishing good good uh, blogs and websites and things where where people were going to come to. So that is stage one of three for the career. <laughs> um, uh, any questions before moving on to stage two? <laughs> well, first, I uh, guess I have one. You mentioned technology. So <clears throat> I know now since the pandemic, everything has changed and new emerging technologies are always coming up. AR, VR, AI, you yeah, know. Yeah. And all they have these data-driven insights that many companies need <clears throat> in order to have their marketing strategies very, very well established and where the money is mm -hmm. coming from, from those platforms. So you mentioned that, and I was just thinking about, Brandon, how do you balance these two elements from being a marketer and also being a technology? Those two yeah. front sides. Well, you always have to be learning. And uh, you, whether it's taking courses, going to conferences, uh, taking meetings and interacting, even if it's um, perspectively hearing uh, new vendors, uh, pitch their product. Even if you're you're not going to go with that vendor, you know you're able to to pick up on what's what's current in the field, what's available in the field. So um, you know, always be learning. That that would be my um, my uh, advice. But also, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, change management related concepts. So when you're when you're when you are bringing a new technology into your company, you need to understand how to get. Uh, a support system at all levels of the company uh, to be advocates uh, within your company and encourage a smooth transition uh, to the adoption of the, the new technology. Of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can continue, but uh, yeah, the, okay. I think sure. it's very important. I think it's really good to mention that because I think nowadays, especially here in Latin America, many companies, Brandon, they try to incorporate themselves in these new technologies but they don't have the infrastructure to do it in order to break that ice and just keep it smooth um, and keep going inside yeah. this new era that we are in in now. But yeah. Well, be before jumping to that, the, the middle years of my career, I, I will say on that is uh, one, one thing that can be helpful is outsourcing initially building a proof of concept on your um that that you that the technology that you're trying to implement or uh deploy is actually going to achieve what you want it to achieve before mm -hmm. bringing it really in house so that's one way that um you know if you're smaller uh mm -hmm. organization right now you don't have the resources to fully establish it in house you can outsource it initially with the goal though that uh it will become more profitable eventually if you bring it in house so that's one thing the other thing is uh with the always learning aspect um, knowing that what with this evolving technology, what you're working on today may just build a stronger skill set for the future. So uh, mm -hmm. when I was talking content creation, I remember back in 2010, we were doing all <laughs> kinds of studies on how to co-create with the audience a pathway where they go down their own um, uh, content journey. And um, well, like like you you watch scene one of a show and then you pick uh do you want to go path one or path two? And then, you know, there's many different branches out that you can go. And, and, but anyway, you, uh, without going into too much detail, uh, co-creation of content has become uh, so ingrained with, with society nowadays. Um, so what we were on early on was not exactly how it turned out, but the, the, the foundational learning skills um, have helped into today, but oh, moving right. into the middle years, <laughs> um, you know, the middle years really involved a lot of, uh, branding, really a move into revenue generation. So not just the promotion side of things, but understanding the, the actual 
revenue generation, mm-hmm. understanding the financials, the sales, mm-hmm. what's profitable, what's not profitable and market uh, mm-hmm. positioning. So, um, you know, in these years, I helped uh, do a lot of marketing in the film industry, but I also helped a lot of marketing in the real estate industry. Uh, and revenue generation being leads, I know you guys focus on leads, but if you go back to what I said in the early foundational years, the four at categories I said were content creation, field marketing, social good, and then this concept of inbound and outbound. Uh, okay. Now, when I go into my middle years, I'm taking more director VP type roles, but my my roles involving re- branding, revenue generation, and market positioning, all those early years of skills of individual specialties have now built into how to be successful at these more umbrella uh, level of, of, of management. Um, so at the time of those early years, I was not always, uh, I, I sometimes would get frustrated or I wouldn't always understand why I'm working on something so specific and it's just not what I wanted to do. But later in these middle years, I found uh, activities, tasks that I was assigned when I was uh, younger ultimately t- built a skill set that was very um, helpful uh, later. So just understand everything is a yeah. step-by-step um, process. process. Yeah, and, and also you mentioned you have been working well with very big brands and Jaguar Land, you, you mentioned it, uh, HP, Intel, Concurrent, Global Living, which is the real estate. And <clears throat> within those brands, Brandon, can you share with us some challenges that you've been facing for these companies? Could you share at least, at least one experience with them, with the public? Yeah. Well, um, you know, with Corker and Global Living, we were bringing together a bunch of independent real estate companies very quickly, and we're putting them all under one brand. And so everybody's coming from being able to uh, either have no regulation on on what they did with their signs and their business cards and all their their, their the way they did their social media posts and, and the look of everything. There was just not a lot of consistency or even if there was at any individual company, now we're bringing it all together under one bigger umbrella. And so uh, it requires, again, going back down to what we were talking on the tech side of like uh, some change management of getting some early adopters and getting advocates on your side who will can then go and spread and, and make the the movement contagious within uh, the others um, to 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 cooperate to understand also explaining the understanding of the benefit of coming under one big brand umbrella um, mm-hmm. what that does for 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 everybody mm-hmm. um, uh, this this was part of the challenge was just getting a bunch of independent uh, focused mindsets to come mm-hmm. in and and uh, and cooperate under one cohesive uh, environment. Of course. And also you mentioned, uh, Brandon, um, about this. Well, there is something now uh, from the pandemic that was the influencer, the influencers in marketing how, with the rise of the influencers in the marketing and content creation that you mentioned that. How can marketers effectively measure this return of investment of these strategies and also ensure that they really align with the overall business projects of each? I know each company is very different, but how can uh, someone with these ideas can measure this type of data with these new yeah. strategies? Well, if there's any type of, uh, and, and this is going to go into what we're, what we'll talk about and uh, what I'm working on now and, and stage oh, okay. three of career, but, <laughs> but, but on the attribution side, so you're yeah. talking about how can you, how can you attribute it? Well, yeah. you know, um, the, the, uh, of course, if there's any, any way to, to properly, uh, link, uh, the, the results each of your affiliates are are bringing, whether it's unique uh, unique URLs, unique phone numbers, you know some of those basic things that are separating uh, the uh, w- what one person's putting out. It's a tra- there's trackability to it. Digital marketing has become so much more trackable than than other uh, prior traditional marketing. But with all that being said, um, there's still a lot of problems with attribution and and linking it. One thing I'll say with your influencers is 
it's not always about the the size of followers that an influencer has um whether whether it's internal in your company and you're trying to make change or whether it's external and you're trying to bring in uh customers it's not always about the size of their following it's it's more about the strength of their relationship so um if oh, if it's uh you know, if it's a, it's an influencer with a smaller following, but very solid uh, uh, connections with their mm -hmm. their followers, um, then uh, they're going to have a lot more influence over those followers. And you can you can aggregate or or add together a bunch of smaller influencers who have strong connections and make a greater impact than working with just larger. Uh, followed influencers. So oh, interesting. I think that's very interesting that you say that because many people, they say, oh, they have to be a lot of millions and millions of followers so I can grab a lot of customers from that. And that point that you mentioned is very uh, different because it's not the followers, it's not the amount, it's the quality. That's right. Yeah. Of course. And well, before we go with the third part, I just because you mentioned social media and I have this this because I think it could be on this part. Um, you know, Brandon, social media uh, is continue to evolve and adapt. So how can marketers create authentic and meaningful content connections with consumers in an era where there's a lot of ad fatigue and skepticism as well? Yeah. Well, I know it's so hard the, the question because it's like, okay, there's a lot of going on in the social media. You just scroll down. There's a lot of things. Yeah. Well, I think uh, one, one key element is be consistent with your brand. So even though your brand may go into different environments, different situations, if you, and, and let's, let's bring up a kind of a international uh, business concept given <laughs> yeah. uh, that you guys are in Latin America and, and, yeah. and what I'm doing So let's say your brand is in uh, Latin America, but you're entering the U.S., you know, different cultures that you got to present. But think of it as a person who travels through the world. Uh, if I come to Latin America, I may, who knows, maybe I wear something different. Maybe I, uh, I, talk, I, I engage in a different activity. Um, <laughs> or if you come to the U.S., same thing. But uh, you're still the core, you're, you're still the same main core of a person. And so um, with that being said, uh, you know, there, there's going to be, you, you, there's always the saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So you need to, you need to do, you need to kind of um, adapt to the culture that's there. But uh, you're still the same person. You're still the same brand. You're still the same. So the consistency uh, as you go across dealing with, Uh, 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 historical yeah. events, political events, weather events, all kinds of, you know, different economies, different everything. You're, you just need to be consistent and understand what your core of your brand is. That's how you're really going to be authentic is, is knowing that it's okay to, it's okay to adapt, but you just never want to lose sight of those true values that you have. Of course, like the main strong foundations of the company. Yeah, that's why you're saying. And personality, and personality. personality. Like your personality can, my my personality, what what I say, what I do in, in Latin America may be different than what I say and what I do in the U.S., but my personality is is still at the core the same. And uh, oh, so no. if you just realize that you're just changing clothes, but you're not changing person, you're you're changing your, your presence as a brand uh -huh. in different countries, but you're not changing your brand, so... Oh, beautiful. I love that. I love that idea. Okay, you can continue now with the third part. Sure. So uh, the third part now is, is you know, through the, the early years, a lot of individual specialties, middle years kind of uh, being a, in a general type of management role that is bringing, to, that's overseeing all those individual specialties. Oh, yeah. And now, and the, the, as my career advances, I'm, I'm working on developing improvements, new knowledge, uh, models to help future marketers and, and, and really understanding where, where were the weaknesses in the marketing field? What are, what are uh, continual problems that many businesses are facing? They're just not able to solve And one of those key challenges has always been in marketing, proper forecasting uh, of your campaigns, but also proper attribution, understanding 
you know, where, wh- why your marketing is working the way it is at a center, just a center, uh, like with, with synergy and, and, and not under, and not thinking that you have to just look at it as individual channels or individual uh, campaigns, individual efforts, what those individual things are doing. It's too small minded to only look at things. Uh, you have to look at them individually, but you also need to look at them um, in an aggregate form uh-huh. and, and and properly attribute. So I'm currently, um, while continuing to advise all kinds of different clients and and working um, uh, on 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 expansion efforts for a variety of clients, I'm I'm also engaged in research right now, and I'm preparing a. Uh, 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 I guess uh, a new like a database of, or oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's for a doctorate program at the uh, University oh. of Florida, but it's for working professionals. So I fly there every uh, two months for a week in residency. But it's an ongoing research um, where I'm oh. I'm trying to find the uh, the impact of uh, oh. modes m- modes or formats of media, and if you just take it at a basic level of video, like uh, text static image, video, audio, uh-huh. what, what sequences, what order. So if you do, if you do a text ad followed by video ad, followed by audio ad, the results are probably different than if you do an audio ad followed by video ad, followed by text ad. And so, uh, um, and, and the reason of, at that level is because then it's kind of immutable as uh, advertising channels change through time. And, and but um, but understanding that that the, the mode or the format of media that you're exposed to, how does that affect humans and at a worldwide basis, not just at like what's the general human tendency uh, for humans to respond to ex- being exposed to a certain sequence and with also the timing in between exposures um, and understanding that. So if I can uh, nail down some of this, it will it will really help going back to the forecasting and attribution, which then goes back to deciding how you you position your mar- yourself in the market, how you you generate revenue, how you really uh, influence branding, and then going back down into you know your content creation, your field marketing, social good, inbound and outbound marketing. So the the way I see this is, you know, yeah, the early years were really that foundational level. It's kind of a mm-hmm. pyramid. The middle years became overseeing those those a bunch of uh, people who have those fa- you know working on those foundational specialties. And then now I'm trying to add some new knowledge and and solve uh, solutions that um, that the industry has been weak on uh, uh, to date. Of course. And also in your research now that you we are in, well, you know, AI is everywhere. AI is like in the tongue of everybody now. And yeah. how can it effectively measure, like how can marketers effectively measure and attribute the impact of AI driven marketing campaigns nowadays? Meta has it. There are many other tech firms that have it as well. But Brandon, I have to say, I have to be honest, many people especially owners, they think that AI will solve their problems and it's not like that. AI, I think it's mm-hmm. like just a tool, a useful tool that you can do things more faster and more accurately. But I want to know your opinion about that. Sure. Yeah, so, well, one one key um, benefit of AI is actually able to, the, the, the ability to uh, take mass amounts of big data uh, and convert it into usable insights. Um, but also not just that, but again, on that generative side of, of creating a new simulations, new um, uh, uh, predictions that are, uh, so, 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 so one of the key elements is that AI will help attribute because its ability to take a complexity and make it si- and make things simple to understand. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing, but uh, how, how do you how do you use AI to improve like efficiency otherwise, and and how does it um, act, how does it contribute itself to campaigns? One key thing is personalization. Um, so when you're uh, you know like if you're if you're on a, a streaming platform or and you're you're watching you're seeing the suggestions given to you you know that's one form of a, of a machine learning on what suggestions it's going to give to you but uh it, it can go further to maybe the ad you're displayed is a different 
ad than what I'm displayed. And maybe they're not even all that different, but you may like cats and I may like dogs. And so uh, in the exact same format of the ad, you see a cat, I see a dog. What does that impact do uh, at, a, at a, uh, uh, an immediate deployment? Fast, fast, coming to you versus coming to me. Does it does it add a lift at all to your your campaign, um, and and so mass personalization of of really trying to get to a one to one consumer experience where no two consumers have the exact same experience, and it goes back. Remember when I said in 2010, working on these content pathways of choosing your pathways. Well, now you know we're we're getting to where based off what you, uh, how you behave, um, your experience is totally different than the, than my experience with the brand, but we each have a relationship with the brand. It's just your relationship is unique to you. My relationship is unique to me. And, and really, so yeah, so, so, um, and, and what does ultimately what we got to find out and it will take some time. I think that's the direction a lot of places are going is, is the one-to-one uh, experience. But does that one-to-one experience ultimately uh, improve the bottom line or top line or the bottom line? Does it does it bring in more revenue? Um, it, 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 does it create more loyalty amongst the consumers? And if everybody's doing it, then how much of a, a competitive advantage is it? Or is it all a wash? Uh, and and it's uh, doesn't really add much value at all. Time will tell that, but but that's what uh, the next thing is understanding the the value of personalization, and it's a challenge that uh, that marketers will have to face. But yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I think it's so. Amazing what you said, Brandon. It's so very enriching and very clear, clear what you say about this. And um, before we wrap it up, um, I would like if you can tell us some um, before after the exciting project that you're doing with the thesis, what other projects you're currently working on or what's next for you next year? Because we're almost like on October. I can't believe that 2024 is almost done. 2025 is like knocking the doors, like, hey, I am here. So what's up next for you? Yeah, so I've well, I've really been helping um, the Reuters organization, Reuters publication, news worldwide news publication, based out of UK. But they're doing a lot of events through the United States, bringing together Fortune 500 leaders, and I've been helping them uh, really expand those events, strategize and, and create their agendas for those events. Um, and so uh, that's that's one element uh, of bringing uh, an international based company in. And I've uh, I've also helped. Uh, uh, manufacturers overseas build brands that are now sold in Walmart and targets, uh, nationwide and, um, and a few other things, but, uh, and I'm selling a lot on Amazon too. I'm, I'm, I've got a business, uh, of my own that, that is selling over 15,000 units, a, a, a year on, on Amazon, but that's a little side thing. So I'm really fractionalizing my time over a variety of clients, uh, and going into the new year, I'm excited. Um, I've got a few, uh, a few new prospects on the agenda that um, helping helping just businesses launch into the United States or locally owned companies expand that are already in the U.S. but expand through the U.S. And um, yeah, there's there's some exciting stuff on the agenda though. So, so if there are companies here in Latin America that would like to have your contact and they would like to expand and they can find you on LinkedIn and write you and what are the prices and the costs and the services? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And um, so you, you can also go to marketingexec.us. Awesome. It's probably easier than, uh, I mean, of course, I think my name should be maybe at the bottom of this uh, right here, B-R-A-N-D-E-N, E-N, not O-N, Cobb, C-O-B-B. And you can find me on LinkedIn. Yes, add me, send me a message. But you can also go to marketingexec.us. might be easier to remember uh, and uh, connect uh, with us there. And then we'll follow up with the meeting um, that will uh, get you going. Um, you know, really uh, uh, customize. This is going to be a one-to-one personal. Um, uh, you know, it's not just like a standardized package that anybody uh, purchases. It's it's going to be based on your needs and what you need to do, but but uh, help achieve your goals of entering into the U.S. And I would love to have a meeting with you and and discuss uh, those needs and and wants. So. Perfect. Thank you. That sounds fascinating. Uh, we can wait to see what's coming up with next. Next for you, Brandon. Thank you so much for sharing your insights as well. 
it's been a pleasure having you on the show. And thank you also to our listeners to turning in to Nova Podcast. Brandon, your last word, please, of inspiration for our community. Just, we said it earlier in the show, but always be learning, especially at this time of, of change, always be learning, uh, never stop uh, growing. So. Perfect. Thank you. Stay creative and see you next time. Thank you, Brandon. Bye. Bye. <laughs>